So I'd like to welcome you all to our virtual reunion Dean's Welcome event as part of Alumni Weekend 2021. Uh, I'm Anika Penn, a 2010 SICE graduate and the current president of the Johns Hopkins Alumni Association. I just want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We're really excited to hear from both Deans Ed Slesinger and uh, Chris Chalenza. We will begin today's session with a panel discussion and then we'll have an audience Q&A portion following the panel. Feel free to go ahead and submit questions throughout the discussion by typing your questions into the chat. Uh, before I introduce the Homewood Deans, I'd like to share a little bit more about the exciting activities we have and will be occurring this weekend, as well as my role as president of the Johns Hopkins Alumni Association. Um, this past year has really challenged us in numerous ways. Uh, despite the obstacles associated with COVID-19, I'm really thrilled that today's events and events throughout the week continue to bring together alumni from across the country and around the globe. Already this week, we have heard from our department leadership, uh, faculty and students in departmental showcases, and learned how to make delicious Smith Island cakes from our very own Steph Muller. In my role as president of the Alumni Association, I hope to increase alumni engagement and highlight the diverse perspectives of our alumni population in continuing to connect and build our community. This past year's virtual engagement, including this week's programming, has propelled this effort, but there is much more we can do together. I'm really excited the rest of the weekend's activities and I'm really excited uh, about the rest of the weekend's activities and I'm excited to engage further and we'll all of, and with all of you in the years to come. Uh, now I would like to take a moment to introduce our Krieger and Whiting School deans. Ed Slesinger is the Benjamin T. Rome Dean of the Whiting School of Engineering, a position he has held since 2014. Welcome. Thank you. And Chris Chalenza rejoined Johns Hopkins from Georgetown in January to become the James B. Knapp Dean of the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences. His appointment to lead the Krieger School is a homecoming as Chris had previously served as Hopkins, at Hopkins as a professor of history and classics, as well as the vice provost for faculty affairs. Welcome, Chris. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure to get to know Ed through my volunteer experiences at Hopkins. In fact, um, he had the misfortune of sitting next to me for four hours at graduation in 2019. Um, so I'm very excited to partner further with Chris and his new role. Ed, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Let's get started with our panel, shall we guys? Yeah, thanks. Um, so the first question I will pose to you, uh, Ed, how did you respond, and it's really about COVID and the response so far to COVID, um, how did you respond to COVID challenges and what opportunities uh, were found through the pandemic in its and its current states? Well, thank you. Uh, happy to answer that question. I uh, want to welcome all the alums who are with us today. It is really wonderful to uh, uh, know that you're still out there and that you're still joining <laughs> us and engaging with Hopkins. And we are beginning to come back and no doubt we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, and so hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll, we'll actually get to see you all in person and maybe even shake hands or something like that. <laughs> something crazy. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that, uh, how Hopkins has responded in so many different ways to this, um, to this uh, the challenges of COVID. Uh, both in terms of its educational mission, its, its research mission, and in terms of having positive impact on, on our society at large and our community. Um, you know, March 10th of 2020, we decided that we had to decant the campus. Uh, that was only three days before the spring break week. And so Wednesday, I think it was a Wednesday, March 10th, students left. Thursday, March 11th, I remember sitting down with... Um, a couple of international students and um, having a discussion with them, a serious discussion about whether they should go home or not overseas uh, for spring break because they were concerned if, the, if, this, if this COVID thing gets worse, will they be able to come back will, to school? And I remember saying to them, and we really were saying to each other, well, clearly by the 2nd of April, which was gonna be a Monday, you know, beginning of April, we'll all be back. And, um, and so you should weigh that in the balance. And, and I, I jokingly, I now say to people, well, I got the date correct. 
I just got the year <laughs> wrong. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, they, I hope they did indeed uh, uh, go back home and they're not in Charles Village for the past year and a half. Um, but so that was the 11th. On the 23rd, Monday the 23rd, we were back and we had in the intervening week, 10 days, we had converted a bricks and mortar institution into an online virtual university. Mm -hmm. And it was absolutely remarkable when you think about it. I mean, there was no advanced warning. We, we just suddenly, everyone was online. Our IT folks, our uh, instructional technology folks, our faculty, our students, we all overnight figured out how to, mm -hmm. how to keep our educational process going. Research was shut down, except for people who were engaged directly in, um, in, in COVID-related research at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but by June, which was not all that far, you know, by, by June, we were bringing people back into the laboratories to pick up our research enterprise. Um, you know, the, the famous map that, uh, that started to track the, the pandemic um, mm -hmm. was one of the first ways that Hopkins really um, established itself as a source of reliable, unbiased information about the spread of the virus. And so we were immediately having an impact uh, through that as well. And then our students and faculty, really, many of them turned their attention to what they could do to help, whether it was making uh, masks that were in short supply or developing technologies to split ventilators so that one ventilator could be used for multiple uh, uh, patients to mm -hmm. uh, genomic sequencing. Uh, really, really, uh, it's, it's really hard to uh, fully capture the, the dramatic uh, change that took place at Hopkins literally overnight within a few mm -hmm. days. So it's, it, it, it really uh, kudos to this, uh, this institution for its response and its resiliency. Yeah, and you know, maybe I can just add there, Anika, uh, just a little bit to add, since I only arrived here in this role in January and I'd come from elsewhere, um, what I noticed was just how well certain things were working that had to work during a time of a pandemic. One was convening leadership in different forums and then you know, coming up with policies and then finding ways to share information. Um, I think Hopkins was very good, and I mean this locally to the community, meaning the faculty and students, um, I think all of us during COVID were wondering, you know, when will things change? And everybody wanted information. So it's a hard thing to do anyway, but I think Hopkins did about as well as you could do on that front, you know, putting up websites that were continually updated, giving people guidance. So I, I, I really noticed that coming in and it was, it was a market, uh, it, was, it was something you could really notice, I thought. Um, in other words, I would just second what Ed says. I mean, I think that, you know, um, it's really, it, this was a hard thing to do for everybody. And, and I would also just say, I think that, you know, kudos to our faculty um, and, and everyone, because, you know, we, we all, I think, tend to worry um, primarily about our students. But, you know, this has been something that's had mental health effects on everybody, right? Yeah. And I think everyone's shown a lot of resilience during it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good point, actually. It brings me to um, my next question, which is how have faculty and students and education practices really been able to maintain a high level of learning this past year? And then um, furthermore, how do you see the educational landscape changing post-COVID now that we're starting to see the beginning of the end, hopefully? So let, 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 let me try to answer that and, and then hand the floor to Chris as well. Um, so we were able to maintain our educational enterprise. As I said, we went online and then the summer af uh, after, the summer of 2020, we started building uh, what we called pop-up studios across campus um, that had uh, high quality lighting, high quality audio, large multiple displays for the faculty to be able to see and engage with the students in a more um, natural way. Um, what, uh, uh, whiteboards that would be highly visible on camera. Um, mm -hmm. And all of this was really, really good. It was very good. There was some uh, really creative things that people did in terms of how to bring students into laboratories that they couldn't actually attend in person. Uh, whether it was using um, uh, body cams to kind of allow uh, a technician who's in the lab to do things 
and then let students see what that person was doing, uh, whether it was actually mailing uh, equipment to students to mm. do some laboratories at home uh, and, and, and so on. And so, and so a lot of that was very, very good, but we also missed a lot. And we can't, we can't um, uh, ignore the fact that certain aspects of education just weren't the same. And I'm thinking, for example, I'll just give you one example. Um, think of first year students who come to a new university. So we had a class, a first year class of students came in in fall of 2020. They're from all points of the compass around the world, around the country. They don't know anybody. And you know, when you're a first year student on campus, how do you meet your new best friend? Well, you, either you have a roommate that you hit it off with, or maybe you sat next to someone in your chemistry lecture, and then you walked across campus together to mm -hmm. go grab some lunch, and that's how you met them. All of those sorts of things didn't exist and still, in, um, well, didn't exist for quite a while. No roommates and uh, no walking across campus, just pressing leave on your Zoom uh, <laughs> experience, which really isn't the same. So, so we also got to see what were the elements that really couldn't be delivered online. What, what are the interactions, the opportunities, the experiences that you just really can't deliver online that, that really define a, a, a residential experience? In answer to your question of how do, you, how do I see the educational landscape changing post-COVID, I would say that it's not that the educational landscape will change, so much that the future of higher education has been accelerated. So those trends that we thought we were aware of and we thought we would have maybe five or 10 years to evolve into over time, they're now on the agenda for this next fall. And so questions like, well, what is the value of a residential four-year educational experience? Um, what benefits should we and could we and do we uh, uh, provide to our students when they're in residence? Uh, what, what kinds of educational experience are actually better done um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a platform such as this and that we should maintain? You know, there was an article actually written by one of our students in the newsletter a couple of uh, weeks ago that argued that all very large lectures uh, henceforth should actually be online. And as, as this student said, so when you're online, as opposed to a very large lecture hall, every student has a first row seat and every student can hear the instructor and the instructor can hear every student's uh, question and you can hear every other student's question and, and so on. And there was an argument that in a, in a very large setting, maybe online when it's your only online course, not when everything's online, uh, maybe a, a preferable modality. So I think all of that's gonna go into our thinking. Uh, as we think about the reality of this coming fall. You know, and Ed, let me pick up on that last point too, because I think it's a really important one that you raise. And I have a few other thoughts on this too, Anika, if I could. Um, yeah. One of the things that, that people in higher ed learned when we all went online, and especially when, you know, students, undergraduate students went to different parts, you know, of, of the world and went home was that, um, you know, we, we have a strong mission at this university um, to think about, you know, diversity and equity and, and, and people being included in the community. I know we're going to talk about this at length later, but just this little piece now. Um, one of the things that happens when people come from different places, to pick up on Ed's point about the importance of the residential um, piece of all of this, is that we have a lot of systems in place in the residential part of the university to help kind of level the playing field for people, right? Mm. But when people went back to different different places, you know, one of the things one would notice was that, um, you know, there might be a student who, you know, um, didn't have internet, right? Had to go into a car to try to get internet, or there might be a student who was living, you know, in a very crowded place, right? Um, there might be students who didn't want to share their screen because they, you know, they didn't want to. And so I think that the residential part, so there's, on the one hand, there's the kind of intellectual utility pedagogically, as Ed was talking about, that sometimes this online world has shown us, like you can actually do certain things differently with online modalities than you can do in person, but you need that residential aspect for so much more than that. So I think that that 
you know, we think about how, how are things going to change, I think that's going to be a way we keep thinking about the importance of the residential part. Another thing I will just say, just unrelated, but, but related to the initial question is just that, you know, it, you would be surprised that how rarely um, faculty members under normal circumstances get together and really talk about first principles when it comes to education. Right, because you know it, things tend to happen seasonally, you know, and they happen for a long time. Well, this forced everybody to do it, right? Because all of a sudden, if you've got to change the way you're teaching fundamentally, right? Like you're used to being in person, you change the way you're teaching fundamentally, you're online, everybody kind of had to go back to first principles. So I think in a way that was a very useful um, kind of a thing. It was a useful exercise. And that's something I would like to see us sort of doing a little bit more of because I think the world changes fast, right? And we have to build in nimbleness and dynamism uh, into what we do. And so as Ed said, this kind of accelerant effect that the pandemic had, um, I, I think we need to take the good parts out of that and, and maybe build, build them in more regularly. Um, that, that's always been a tension with universities, you know, in the US, right? If you think about it, there's not really one system of education. There's about 4,500 different institutions of higher education, you know, that span the range from very vital community colleges to regional state universities, to small liberal arts colleges, to big flagship publics, to, to, to research universities that are part of the American Association of Universities as we are. All of them are gonna have kind of different, you know, mm -hmm. different physiognomies and different ways that they look at the world, different ways that they do things. But the, the central tension you always see in higher ed is that tension between tradition um, and, and, and dynamism, right? Like we do things that are traditional because they work, we pass them down because they're traditional often and often that's a good thing. But I think we always have to remember to give, to give ourselves that kind of, um, you know, that gentle, that kick in the pants to remember that it's time for yeah. us to also think nimbly as well. So I think this pandemic gave us, gave us that, maybe a little more like than what want. Yeah, <laughs> Joel. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. On that note, I guess, um, I'm wondering what you both think uh, is the role or goal of CUE2 and, and how might it look different post-COVID? Um, and, you know, this is sort of just a follow on. Um, what do you see as opportunities to influence the student experience in undergraduate education? So um, Q2, as we like to call it, uh, the second commission on undergraduate education. Um, uh, for those in the audience who may not know, this was an effort that uh, I co-chaired with my then co uh, colleague Dean in the School of Arts and Sciences, uh, Beverly Wendland, uh, with a, a fairly large uh, uh, group of faculty, students, alumni, staff, uh, and we were charged by President Daniels to, to think about undergraduate education and how we might reimagine undergraduate education. Now, interestingly, I, I, you know, again, um, and interesting that we were embarked on this and we embarked on this well before COVID. We, we, we finished the process during COVID, um, but the, 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 this was all instigated well, well before COVID. Um, the Q2 report that came out actually during the COVID period um, is fairly long and detailed, but I would say it has a, a certain number of hallmarks that we um, that that really define the vision. Uh, the first is the idea that undergraduates should uh, come out of Hopkins uh, being uh, well grounded in a small number of what we call foundational abilities: uh, literacy, numeracy, a ability to communicate, and, and so on. They're, 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 um, enumerated in the, in the report. The, the second hallmark I would say is the idea of flexibility. Our students are diverse, but so is their paths in life and their uh, ultimate careers and their ultimate career goals. We are not teaching just the next generation of university mm -hmm. professors. There are some of our undergraduates who will ultimately become university professors. Um, but, but the vast majority will do a great many other things, even if they go on to graduate school or not, or industry or foundation work or government and so forth. And so there has to be flexibility even within curricula, even within traditional curricula to allow maintaining the rigor of course, and maintaining the definition of what the different disciplines are, but at the same time, understanding that, for example, in mechanical engineering, one mechanical engineer uh, has aspirations to be a, 
a, a congressperson and another one has the aspiration of being a, a professor at a university. And so how do you accommodate f- flexibly uh, their different a- aspirations? And finally, that, a- that flexibility extends to the extent that, that uh, the Q2 report suggested that every program have sufficient flexibility that students could embark on a semester long immersive experience in their domain that is not course based and that that experience would also count academically towards their program of study. Um, And so this is by no means a semester off, but rather in a sense acknowledging that the course as the fundamental unit of education um, has to give way a little bit to other mechanisms of learning, other other, uh, venues for learning. Now, in relation to COVID, and how is all this related to COVID? Well, initially it was not related to COVID. But I think what COVID showed us is how flexible we can be and how many different modalities there are in which to learn. And so I think that some of the potential objections that people may have raised to this idea of flexibility, this semester that we're calling the Hopkins semester, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, COVID showed us, you know, there are different ways of doing things and accommodating the, this kind of vision that Q2 uh, is putting forward. Yeah, I mean, those are just great points. And I feel very grateful, you know, to have come back when all of this great work on Q2 has been done. I really want to thank Ed for it, um, the, the role he played. And of course, Beverly, my predecessor in this role. Um, and, and I guess looking at it, maybe from a slightly different angle, Anika, I guess here's here's what I see. I mean, I see that when I look out at the world now, I think possibly the biggest problem we face as a society is how do you read the world that we're in? And what I mean is mm-hmm. every one of us are, you know, we're all buffeted by these, you know, waves, these wildly undulating waves of information that are coming at us from all sides and all corners on screens and tablets and, and everywhere, right? Um, and, you know, as somebody who studied the history of the book and so on, what I can say, this, this has never happened before in human history. I mean, even reading is something we were not really kind of evolutionarily built to do regular reading. This kind of information intake was really not something, you know, it's, this is really new for humanity. So when I think about our students who are coming in from age 18 to age 22, you, you start to think, well, all those foundational abilities that I mentioned are, are really necessary, number one. And number two, I think that at universities, when you, when you do institutional change, it's not like you're going to be at your best if you're doing 180 degree shifts in what you do. I think you become better when you become your best self. And I think our best self at Hopkins is really research and discovery. And so I think we really need to involve our undergraduates at every phase in that research and discovery precisely because it's no longer enough for them to just take information and knowledge in. They have to have a hand in making knowledge for themselves, right? That's what I meant about reading the world, really understanding in an insider way how expert knowledge is produced by doing it themselves. And that's why the things that Ed was talking about, one of them is the Hopkins semester. I think that's gonna be really important. And that could be a whole number of different things. Like the key will be, it'll be something experiential, right? And so maybe that means that it's a really um, focused internship with coursework built around it to really profit from it. Maybe it's, maybe it's a, a project abroad. Maybe it's you know, a project the student leads you know, here in a lab. But either way, I mean, it's going to be something that they're going to really own. And I think the next question is, how do you, how do you build toward that? And I think that's what, what we're all working with now. And I mean, Ed and I are charged by this report with implementing all of these ideas. And so, you know, you, you can't just implement it out of nothing. We've got to do stuff and try things. So the thing we've been working on really hard is the first step. And the first step is going to be we want every first year student to be able to, to start out their undergraduate career with a small seminar with a faculty member. Mm. Um, and, and, and so we're working hard on that. I think by not this coming academic year, but by the next academic year, we're gonna have enough of these to cover every student. And what's important about that is that, first of all, these will be small, right? So imagine about 15 students. The second thing is that they will get to know somebody well who's devoted their life to researching something right and so of course you know as ed said most of our students aren't going to go become professional scholars but they're going to see somebody who's developed a passion for something get to know them 
And the hope is that a mentoring relationship will begin there. And I think for us, the things we need to talk about now, and these are the uncertainties here, is how do we build on that vertically, right? Like, what do we do after that? You know, how do we build a community maybe that comes out of that first year group that then have certain research interests? How do we build toward this Hopkins semester? So I think it's just, I would say, it's not just an exciting moment. I would almost go so far as to say, and Ed might disagree with this, that this is almost like a second founding of the university in some ways, because Hopkins was always very conscious of its mission to produce new knowledge through research, to train the next generation of scholars in, gra in, in graduate education. But now we're really at a place where I think we're saying we, we must raise up the undergraduate experience here, um, you know, and, and make sure it, it really is gonna prepare students for the world, you know, not the world of yesterday, but the world of today and tomorrow. Yeah, I can see how, I mean, the first year seminars are really laying the foundation of a, to have a healthy relationship with inquiry. And yeah. that, you know, that relationship, whether you have a research project or whether you have some new work out in the field, um, and then, you know, I'm 10 years out of school, that healthy relationship with inquiry <laughs> has helped me through several career changes uh, just in the past 10 years. So um, that sounds really exciting. Um, you mentioned research, uh, both of you mentioned research um, in talking about the, the Q2, but also, Ed, you mentioned that research had, had been uh, largely shut down in the beginning, uh, during the beginning of COVID. And I guess I'm wondering, um, how has research continued uh, after that initial shutdown this past year? And I'm wondering if you can share some examples of how faculty and students have shown resiliency in their research and continue to impact the, uh, the community and the globe? Sure, so uh, as I said, the, the, the research uh, enterprise back in March of 2020 was, was essentially shut down, uh, as I, and, but uh, also, as I said, except for those folks who were already working on aspects of COVID and, 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 and things that could impact that. Um, in June, when we sort of brought researchers back to the campus, those that actually couldn't do their research unless they were physically in their laboratories, um, we produced a, a, a set of rules in terms of de-densifying laboratories, uh, operating procedures within labs, um, testing procedures um, of, of, of faculty and students, contact tracing if somebody comes up positive and, and so on and so forth. Um, and slowly but surely, we, as we gained experience, as we compared notes with our uh, peer institutions, we, we kind of allowed more and more people to come back. I believe I'm correct in saying that we have not had, over what is now close to a year, a single case of verified transmission of the virus in the lab or on campus. Um, that That's what great. cases we have had have occurred elsewhere uh, off campus where, where and, and so it taught us that if you have good regulation, if you have good oversight, um, you, you can do things uh, remarkably safely. Um, and that required a lot of adjustments by our faculty and our students, um, just in the way they operate. Um, you know, travel, no travel, that means no going to conferences. Interestingly, and this is all, this again speaks to things that will undoubtedly stay post COVID. Certain conferences decided to, to hold their, their, their annual meetings, uh, but to make those virtual events. What they saw was greater participation from a more diverse set of uh, researchers mm -hmm. from around the world because the, the, the underfunded scientists somewhere in some part of the world who didn't, didn't have the money to uh, get on an airplane and fly to California to the convention center in, in Long Beach uh, and take part in, 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 and live in a hotel and, and for, for you know, a week, uh, nonetheless was able to participate in the conference. And so again, a little bit like our educational experience, um, not having an in-person conference experience is not ideal. On the other hand, bringing in a, a broader range of individuals to take part in the conference was actually better. And so I imagine that a lot of conference organizers are gonna be thinking about how much of our conference is gonna be in person? How much is it mm. gonna be virtual? How much is gonna be hybrid? How do, we, uh, how do we manage that going forward? Um, so that also impacted uh, the, 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 the research enterprise. A lot of our researchers turned their attention to COVID 
and made very quick uh, turns in, 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 in terms of, of, of uh, contributing in that way. I can think, for example, of one researcher whose uh, work is uh, related to models of the human heart and um, uh, cardiac arrhythmia. This is Natalia Trinova, who works in biomedical engineering. And I know that she turned her attention and very quickly got funding from NSF um, to uh, look at machine learning algorithms to predict uh, cardiac issues that are um, created by COVID. Uh, and, and that that was a successful project. And that's just one example. Um, there are some folks in our school who uh, started doing the genomic sequencing of the virus and were mapping its, its, uh, its mutation rate and where it was going uh, and gaining insight into that aspect of, 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 the, of the virus and the pandemic. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the folks who were just collecting data, displaying the data on the, on the now famous COVID map um, and, and uh, making that data widely available to researchers around the world to work with as well. Um, and if you think about it, that's going to undoubtedly produce research for years to come because mm -hmm. no doubt there will be those who will look at the data and say, look at which policies worked, look at, look at which policies mm -hmm. didn't work because you can see the rate of increase or decrease, uh, look at which uh, countries may not have been reporting accurately because something mm. about the data doesn't look uh, natural. Looks oh, sure. unnatural. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so lots of interesting uh, uh, potential, even again, past COVID in terms of how we do things. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've seen phenomenal energy and resiliency on the part of scholars uh, and students during this whole episode. I mean, for students, you know, when I talk to undergraduate students, especially, I, you know, I always tell them, look, you know, one of your first interview questions five years from now is going to be, what did you do with your COVID time, right? And, you know, when mm. you learn what they have done, right, they've done so many interesting things, uh, you know, pivoted in so many different ways, and just sticking with it through all of the things that I'd mentioned earlier about, you know, especially in crucial parts, you know, first year students, seniors not being able to be here, but nonetheless persisting, then on the faculty front in the Krieger School, I mean, we've had people who pivoted in their research too. Um, they worked on the development of virus detection. Some did structural studies of the SARS virus. Uh, others did structures of the evolutionary history of the virus. And, and honestly, an unusually large number of grants were submitted to the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, the NIH. Um, and, and the funding levels have actually increased in the Krieger School, believe it or not, during this uh, mm -hmm. pandemic. So, so I think, you know, everybody was really kind of on the ball. It showed that, you know, they were going to keep going no matter what the conditions were. Uh, very impressive, I think, just looking at it uh, overall. That's great to hear. I have one last question, and then we're going to turn it over to the audience for questions. Um, but this one is on uh, DEI initiatives. Um, I'm wondering what are the Homewood schools doing to ensure a, a diverse environment and improvement of efforts around diversity and inclusion? Um, and specifically, how is your school supporting and collaborating with the university-wide roadmap on diversity and inclusion task force? So, so within that uh, framework, uh, I um, personally, I co-chair the uh, institutional accountability subgroup of the, uh, of the task force. Uh, we've had some in very interesting discussions, very um, uh, useful discussions, and these have um, um, resulted in a number of recommendations that have gone into the task force, uh, and, um, and, and so that'll, that'll go forward uh, in, in, in all that we do. And one of the things that people will see in those recommendations is that actually um, a lot of the recommendations are going to come back to the schools and actually the departments and the programs. Because one, one of the things we, we said um, in the, particularly in the institutional accountability work, working group is that accountability is everybody's responsibility, mm -hmm. which may sound a little uh, simple, but the, the message there is it's all well and good to hold the president and provost accountable. It's all well and good to say, you, you, you should do something about this. But the reality is that the, the something gets done every day in a million different decisions that are made, a million different interactions that happen across the whole institution. And so accountability is really everyone's responsibility, not just, not just leadership. Of course, it's leadership's responsibility as well. 
but um, but that's one one thing that came out of that. Now, in terms of actual uh, um, actions that we're taking, um, uh, we are staffing up uh, in terms of the efforts in that area. Uh, Chris and I uh, uh, share an assistant dean for diversity and inclusion. Uh, that was something we that I and Beverly started uh, some number of years ago, four or five years ago. It was a bit of an experiment to see how that would work for the schools. So we, we shared uh, um, such a position. Uh, we're now in the process of searching for a second individual so that each school could have their own assistant dean for diversity and inclusion. Um, we've changed, and I, I don't wanna to get too much in the weeds, but we've changed the way we do faculty searches, with the way we do unconscious bias training, um, the way we uh, have offered admissions incentives at the graduate level. Um, and all of these things have borne fruit um, one of the things I always say to, to, um, to my colleagues in the school and, uh, and, and just in general about the attitude we should have about this is that this is a process that if we want it to be real, it's something that has to be sustained. It can't be sort of this week's, um, you know, what's a trending Diversity topic. effort, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's, this has got to be something that, that, that ultimately changes culture. And uh, because culture is the most difficult thing there is to change. Um, and so, and we, and I could point to some numbers where we've done well. Um, for example, we, we increased our uh, percentage of uh, women in engineering, which are an underrepresented group, as well as URMs in engineering by about twice the rate uh, at which we've increased our professoriate. And so that uh, tells you that the percentages are going up. Um, so a lot that we've done, but a lot more work to be done going forward as well. Yeah, and I guess I would say, let me just, I, I think maybe coming at it from another angle, because Ed has described well, I think what the Homewood schools are doing, and certainly in the Krieger School, we have a very robust um, kind of faculty hiring policies that I, I think, you know, ha have really also borne fruit. Um, but I think the, the big thing to remember for me is that this must be a front burner initiative all the time. You know, diversity, mm -hmm. equity, inclusion is not something you do and then it's over. It's a new way of thinking about the world and recognizing that we're going to be more excellent the more we have different perspectives, really different perspectives, meeting with each other. Um, and I think especially to think about those three words, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, even though we sometimes separate them for analytical reasons, the truth is they're linked. And so, you know, you, mm -hmm. when you bring a diverse group of people together, um, they must feel included. Feel included. Community, right? Because <laughs> if they don't, they're not gonna have an equitable experience, right? Even if you could say, well, the resources are there, if they don't know they're there, or if somehow they're feeling like there's some kind of a, an invisible fence around the resources, they're not gonna do it. So I think, for example, of the fact that 27% of our students now are um, first generation limited income students. And I really feel like we have to meet the moment to be there with them. Um, it's very, very important. Um, and, and I think it's something that um, you need to talk about a lot openly. I think, you know, um, what I always say to people is, you know, unconscious bias doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you a person, a normal person. Like we all have, them, right? So it's important when you're starting, let's say a faculty search or, or when you're looking at prospective graduate students to remember what those might be. And they can be everything that, you know, easy things. Like you can imagine, you know, faculty who are busy doing a search and just targeting, you know, candidates who come from a list of five or six different schools, right, with PhDs. Well, what if you open that up to other perspectives, you know, do holistic reviews and see not just, you know, where someone's final degree has come from, but how far they've come, right? Because that'll show the resiliency that they've done. So I just think it's gotta be something that you, you really need to bring up at, at just about you know every major initiative you have, um, because again, it makes us a better community um, uh, the more we do it. So, just to yeah. supplement what it said, I remember being at a meeting of uh, the the some of the heads of the fly effort, um, and one of uh, someone I can't remember her name said, you know, we have to think not only of how. Um, these students, how the university will have an impact on on fly students, but how the fly that how bringing together this really diverse community of URM and fly students will change the university. Yeah, I thought that was really profound. Yeah, it's um, super important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
No. So I, I just want to move on to, to the audience uh, panel of uh, the audience questions and, and there's one that's come in um, and it and it's uh, really about uh, another lesson learned from COVID and I'm what and the the alum would like to know if, if during situations like COVID the COVID pandemic did the university or perhaps in the future would the university consider prioritizing the on campus students by major. Um, meaning um, having medical and technical majors on campus and, and other majors perhaps really perhaps online was was that something that was under consideration or might it be something that's under consideration going forward so uh, so when we when we um, brought researchers back to campus we we did prioritize uh, in that emergency moment those who act, who we felt had to uh, have particular access to, re, to to facilities on campus. Now you can't do uh, biological research if you're not standing at a lab bench when, in a fume hood and, and so forth. There's just you, just no way to do that. We did we did um, prioritize in in the order in which we brought people back. I will tell you though that what we found out was that even those people who you said uh, or you might have thought um, didn't require access to, to facilities on campus, um, then many of them said, you know, the way I do my research, the way I interact with people, even if I'm doing math proofs, um, the way I stand at a whiteboard with my students and we correct each other and, and write together and interact together, isn't reproducible on, online. And so we mm. slowly brought all of them back as well. So we did prioritize in, a, in that sort of triage moment, if you will, uh, in that sense, but generally speaking, and I, I'm speaking here as an engineer, but I will make a pitch that all those students and all of the intellectual life of the campus that appears not to need facilities on campus is essential to the success of everyone. I can't be an engineer and design systems at the highest level and really think deeply about my autonomous systems, unless I'm talking to philosophers, unless I'm talking to ethicists, mm -hmm. unless I'm talking to public policy people. Uh, it's, it's very one dimensional to, to mm -hmm. imagine learning about these things uh, just in a very narrow field and not having interaction. In fact, that's, that's what the university is all about. The university is about these interactions across all of these different fields. Um, the life of the university, the, 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 that, that, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. Chris is, is the man of words. He'll, 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 he'll tell me what word I'm looking for, but this, this, this soup that everyone is in is so critical to, to the success of everyone and to the learning of everyone and to the research of everyone that um, I, would be, I would be very much um, against the idea that we somehow in a purely utilitarian way say, well, if you need access to this facility, you're on campus, but if you don't, you sit at home and, and, and go online. That's personal opinion. Yeah, I, I mean, I can, I can supplement that. And I got some words for you if you want the <laughs> word. So, um, so I think, you know, we talked about tradition and dynamism and tradition and innovation. And I think, you know, we owe a lot of our basic customs to the development of universities in medieval Europe in the, the 13th and 14th and 15th centuries. A lot of our terms come from that era. So when we say, for example, you know, you're getting a Bachelor of Arts degree in the medieval Latin sources of the time that was called a Baccalaureus Artium. When we say you're getting a Master of Arts degree that was called a Magister Artium, um, all of the things of us wearing robes and hats, all of that kind of comes out of those customs. And one term that, that you see used in the sources of the time is the word university, but the Latin word is universitas. And what that basically just means is the whole. It doesn't indicate necessarily anything educational. And the way you see it used in medieval sources is when they're talking about you know, universities, you see it talked about as the universitas magistrorum et scholarium, the university, the whole of teachers and students. Meaning that what was essential to universities from the start was precisely that notion that Ed was talking about of community, right? That you need the community, that the community is mutually reinforcing, and that even if you're doing different stuff, and even if you have different disciplinary habits and different goals, and even if the goals even of different schools are different, that co-location, that being together, um, really is the core of what universities are about. So just to kind of supplement that, so I, I would I would agree with Ed that I think that 
what we need to do is we need to take all the good stuff that we've learned from going online, find the places where that makes the individual pedagogy more, more um, robust and effective, but then make sure we're always looping back to that notion of community, because that's really, that's what's gonna make us what we are, I think. And again, you know, across the landscape of higher education in the US, there's gonna be different ways of solving this. But I think in the context of research universities that have a strong um, leaning toward giving also undergraduate students a great education, that, that notion of community is just essential. That's great. That's great. Um, I have a, a second question, which is um, just about our undergraduate population. How are the youngest students and the new first years being guided and tended to? And, and just to follow up, um, what are we doing to guide the 15, 16, and 17 year old prospective students in their college search? So one of the things that uh, we recognized uh, during, but especially during, uh, the Q2 deliberations is that as we bring in a more diverse student body that may have uh, fewer of their own resources, and, and by resources, I don't mean financial resources, but uh, just the uh, community that they come from may not include the family they come from, may not include people who have been to university before or who know how universities operate, uh, that those individuals will likely need additional support and guidance. But also as we make our curriculum more flexible and give people choice and give people different kinds of opportunities that they too will need more guidance and, and, and uh, um, advice. And so uh, we recognized and, are, and are now are investing in uh, a fairly robust uh, advising infrastructure for students with uh, more professional advisors who can advise uh, students about the types of opportunities available to them, how to access those opportunities. You know, we talk about access to universities uh, for, for different, a more diverse population of students, but then you have to talk about access at the university. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your mom is a university professor, then she can advise you on how to go get about a, get a research project or who to go talk to at the university. If your mom is not a research univer a, 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 a university professor, you may have no knowledge of that. So you don't actually have access. Um, and so there's, there's various aspects of access once you're in the university that you have to address. So all of this has told us, and this is what we're acting on, that we have to have a far more robust advising infrastructure for students and then have the faculty in large part, not exclusively, play a more robust mentoring um, uh, uh, role so that you have both advising and mentoring. And it's not necessarily the same people who do both. Uh, and so we've taken a, a fairly close look at that. We, we did a study, um, excellence in academic advising study. Um, and that along with Q2 has informed how we are building out those functions to, to guide those students along. And by the way, the question asked about the youngest students, but it's true at all, at all levels. Mm -hmm. Should I go to grad school? Should I delay going to grad school? What are my options if I do go to grad school? What are my options if I don't go to grad school? Uh, what sort of careers am I going to embark on? What, what careers could I embark on? I mean, it goes on and on and on. We're seeing more demand for advising with our master's students and with our PhD students. Because again, not all of our PhD students are necessarily going to be university professors, even though they have a doctorate. And so that the, the need for advising and mentoring, it cuts across the entire spectrum of, of students that we serve. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. And I think that interestingly, I mean, what, one thing I think that higher ed has been searching for, for the last 30 or 40 years, and I think now has really recognized, and it's reflected in a lot of the results that Ed is talking about, you know, more robust advising, more robust views of the student is that, you know, you could argue that there was like an imaginary point A of universities when big time research universities really came into being in the US, which I think you could make a lot of arguments as to when and how, but I would say specifically in the era of World War I, um, you know, that was by then the German university heritage was inherited into the US, you know, research had proven itself. I think that um, without saying it in so many words, the basic idea was everybody at a university is just a pure intellect. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And so faculty are doing work and they're discovering new knowledge and they're then teaching that knowledge to these students who are also pure intellects. Right. And, and in, in a way, there's a sort of nobility of that idea. Right. You know, your faculty knowledge is going to be the same, you know, in Baltimore as it's going to be in Tokyo. Right. Um, and, and it's aspirationally a universal view like that. Everybody is the same. But the truth is, right. You know, those intellects are in brains. Those brains are in bodies. Those bodies are in places. They have experiences and so on. And so I think that we've gradually realized that people aren't just brains and bats, right? I mean, they are more than that and they need more things, you know, and so to, to succeed and that, so I think all of that, what Ed is talking about, I mean, I think as we're welcoming first year students, um, I think that this notion of, you know, having these first year seminars and beginning those conversations about mentoring relationships with faculty is gonna be key because, you know, more things will come up in those relationships than just you know, just the field of study, mm -hmm. right? Other things are gonna come up. And I think that's very important for us to, to kind of recognize that. And so I'm really glad we're at this point um, in, in the history of Johns Hopkins. You know, I, I, I might add something about this that, uh, that I'd like to share with the alums. So for, for many years, we, we, we had this um, idea of a common read that prior to the uh, uh, students coming to the university, they, it would be recommended that they would read a certain book. Um, and then um, when they arrived on campus, there would be small discussion groups about that one book that they read, uh, maybe in the summer before their first year. Um, we, we felt that that was a rather limited experience. Uh, at the end of the day, it only engaged the first year students. It only engaged them for a time when they kind of first arrived, maybe during orientation week. And it was really focused on one book, might have been an excellent book, what it might have been an important book, but it was only one book. Uh, a few years ago, uh, prior to COVID, uh, we changed the common read to the common question. We said, we're going to have a thematic question every year that we want to um, address. And it is going to be addressed throughout the year in various events, mm -hmm. in various kinds of seminars and panel discussions and interactions, maybe also woven into discussions in various courses. And the idea was to create questions that um, uh, are answerable in different ways from different perspectives and different fields. And this is, again, looking at the, 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 the first year seminar and, and how that could come, come to be in, in this construct. Um, so for example, the first year we, we did the common question, the question was, what is intelligence? And you know, a historian answers that question very differently than a philosopher, very different than a computer scientist, very differently than a neurologist. What is intelligence? And I think that those sorts of, you, you said it very well, Annika, this idea of understanding how to begin your path in inquiry. Because you know, sometimes the first student, the first year students come in, and if you ask them that question, well, the kid who gets best on his on his exams, he's intelligent. But then you say, well, what about the computer scientist who says artificial intelligence, and what about the philosopher who says something about the soul and the spirit and and so on? And I think that's the sort of thing. That's the way we've got to get our students to think that these all of these things come together, and are much more. In, there are very important easily articulated questions that are profoundly difficult to answer. Right, which is to say that this is an intellectual community, right? And that's part of our job is to have students become part of it. I mean, thinking about what Ed said, so this year's common question is what is the common good? And, and you know, there's the opportunity to do groups with students. So I did, a, I did you know, about an hour with um, eight or so first year students on this question. And we had read a little article about a book that had come out on the environment and climate change, you know, because that's one of those things that is very common to everybody, right? And we talked about that. And, and you could see them kind of bouncing ideas off of each other and, you know, people changed opinions during this conversation, all just to support, I think, what I'd said about, you know, um, just what the nature of this intellectual community should be like, right? It should be, you know, constantly being willing to kind of question and revisit and, and continue learning. Because I think if there's one thing we've learned about how people learn, it's that they learn by revision, right? You know, you, what, you re what really sticks with you is, right? You know, you, you come into any class or any subject matter at all, you probably know a little something about it, right? 
But the more you sort of revise that concept of what you know, the more that revision that you've done yourself really sticks with you over time. And so I think these common questions, this notion of the community is a really important one. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think the, the concept of the common question is one that within the Alumni Association, we've been keen to build um, multi-generational discussions about because uh, we, when it was introduced, it was, it was something that the alums uh, we're really, really, the alums that we work with, we're really, really excited about. Um, and what an opportunity to create larger discussions among alumni groups along those lines. Um, That's great. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not, I, 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 we're at the beginning that. stages of, yeah. of, of discussing how we do that as part of lifelong learning initiatives for alums. But, um, but it, is, it speaks to the original point that the, the desire for inquiry and great conversations and building a community extends long after you graduate <laughs> from Johns Hopkins. Um, there are three more questions and we are at 357. So what I would like to do is um, just say there's a question around uh, reparations and the history of Johns Hopkins um, that was newly discovered. And I would just like to say that at 5 p.m. today, there's going to be a retrospective event with Marcia Jones and Allison Saylor, and they're go and, and the title of it is "Reexamining Johns Hopkins History." History, and so they're going to discuss the history of Mr. Johns Hopkins there, and that might be a good question for that forum. There is an additional question about diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts and about the dramatic expansion of um, administration and the costs associated with that and how that is reflected in undergraduate tuition. Um, and then there's a question about engineering schools, uh, how they, how you are planning to go, um, how you support students who want to go into industry instead of grad school. Um, what I'd like to do is, is take those questions to borrow from, I think it was the Westworld or Scandal, um, and get answers and then provide those uh, to the alums, maybe via email or, or through some other forum. Are you guys okay with, sort? I, I'll send those to you, those questions you can think through what, what your thoughts are and then we'll make sure that those get answered. Sure. Absolutely. I just sprung this on you. So <laughs> great. Well, uh, I just want to say thank you for um, the engaging conversation and discussion. It was really, truly inspirational. Um, and it's been wonderful spending this time together and, and hearing about all the fantastic work that faculty and students are doing and really the impact that they're having on their communities here and beyond. Um, so uh, for the alums, I just wanna say, please join us for the rest of the week's activities, including the Hopkins retrospective and fireside chat that I just just mentioned with Martha Jones and Allison Saylor. Uh, there's coffee with the president coming up and uh, crab soup exploration. So wishing you a great rest of the weekend and thank you to both deans for joining us this afternoon. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. It was our pleasure.